Okay. So my name's Kathleen Halser, and uh, I'm talking uh, about some ideas that are in, you know, kind of a formative and uh, rough shape. Uh, didn't have time to do any refined thinking today because we're trimming the tree and a bunch of people coming. But anyway, this is um, in response again to the uh, probing deeper into the idea of what free speech is and how does free speech play out in different cultural contexts. So this uh, particular contribution is about uh, language extinction. Um, linguists estimate that there are about 7,000 languages around, uh, and many of these are going extinct every year. Although this is not exactly tapping, topping the list of Extinction Rebellion's priorities, nevertheless, it's really relevant to our thinking about free speech, because the language in which, which, which we speak is very much part of our repertoire of expression and the way in which we are free. So languages are distinct ways of experiencing the world, and languages have evolved uh, in different places. So languages, for example, that have evolved in a forest context tend to have more words for a phenomenon that we can no, no longer grasp because we live in amidst a bunch of skyscrapers, sidewalks, and mowed lawns. Um, and just as cultures on islands might have lots of words for water and weather that we don't have a sophisticated grip on uh, these kind of refined and distinctive vocabularies in our various varieties of English, which has a whole lot of varieties and dialects itself. Um, Asifa Majid, who's a cognitive psychologist at Oxford, has said that indigenous languages contain immense reserves of knowledge, biological knowledge about flora and fauna, interweaving the world and knowledge itself. So language itself is a form of knowledge, and it is specific to the language that it's being expressed in. So this is a reflection which, of course, um, it tries to add some nuance to the, you know, the way in which language research has been done in English has often assumed that it there's something universal about it. And my thinking today is underlining the way in which languages are not necessarily universal. So hovering between word and thought, you might wonder which is origin and which is destination. Is the word the origin? Or is it where something that occurs beforehand starts out? Is language the destination and thought the origin or the other way around? Um, English has been a language of research, you know, because the U.S. is such an educational powerhouse in addition to being a, um, you know, potent phenomenon of late, ca late capitalist economic domination. Um, the research and scientific things associated with that economic dominance have meant that English is, is a very dominant language of research. And we're discovering, actually, that it's limited, even though it's often been premised as if research done in English were universal. So this, in a way, and people like Asiva Majid challenge that universality, and they want to transcend the insolence the chutzpah, really, behind our assumptions about Mother English. Um, language is the snail shell that we live in. You always carry it with you. Other languages tend to bounce off our own little shell. They can't find the door in where you are curled up, a dormant guardian of your own tongue. So, our languages, our tongues, are tangled in history that our minds do not yet know. And to use an example that will be familiar to a lot of you who are, who are from New England, think about Indian place names, which define the New England landscape. It's just names full of meanings we don't know and tribes that we have lost. For example, in Algonquin, the Housatonic, the name of the river on which I live means place beyond the mountains in Algonquin. 
And Manhattan, to take a more famous example in Munsee, a different uh, Indian language, is actually the place to gather wood to make bows, a good place to gather wood to make bows. A lot of etymologists have talked about this, and one of the Dutch etymologies of this, more laughable than not, is the place of great drunkenness, but that's uh, not a really legitimate uh, genealogy of Manhattan. So thinking on language, do you imagine that you can think without language? Is there an extra linguistic outside of language experience, a pre-language? I think yes. And I think if we sort of think about this a little bit, we're going to be turning very quickly to sense experience and saying feeling probably pre, pre is before thinking. And so, you know, take the example of dreams. My dreams unfurl in colors. I toss and turn in crimson and chrome. That's not language, it's my dream. So what's the word's relationship to idea and thought? How does experience translate itself into the plasticity of the brain? People who are bilingual are very interesting examples of that. And, you know, I know people who are, you know, had a second language as when they were kids and kind of lost it because they didn't use it much in adults who still dream in their early language. And I myself, I'm not particularly fluent in German and my French is really bad, but I still sometimes have dreams which are distinctly in other languages. And I feel like I may be dreaming something different. So language is part of words and words are part of translating experience, but they're not the same as. So I've been thinking here about how language provides a vessel for an infinite quantity of thought. So the more languages we know, maybe the more thoughts we can have. Language is a tool to pry open the world. Language contains the world, but it also creates the world. So sense and language, Think of, thinking about that pre-language experience, think about something like smell. We've got a whole lot of words for it, bad, acrid, rancid, smelly, putrid, rank, fetid, odiferous, stinky, foul, or the even more authentic uh, toddler words, yucky and icky. And these are all things that can pre precede language, but we know that we are thinking it, even if we don't have a word for it. So from experience to the word, we can uh, very much uh, think that there's there's a big gap, It's and it's a gap in meaning that is immensely rich for poetry and, I think, for free speech. Uh, Noam Chomsky, who is, uh, in addition to being a lifelong culture warrior and crit critic of uh, neoliberalism and capitalist brainwashing and many, many other things, uh, as a linguist, he famously made an example in which he said, we can make words make sense. We can say words that grammatically and semantically fit together that actually don't make sense. And his most famous example of this is uh, green ideas sleeping furiously. You know, we can understand that. And yet uh, it's, uh, yeah, okay, doesn't really make sense. So by looking at that category mistake, what Noam Chomsky called a category mistake, we get closer to the idea that we can think something, we can put it in language, even if it's a semantic error, and yet be understood, if not love it. And in fact, poets have gone mad with the uh, green idea of sleeping fur furiously. You can find it in a lot of poetry by uh, well-known people. So in conclusion, we are. I'm saying that we are missing language density by focusing on our mother tongue, the language we know best, which happens to be in the case of English colonially and economically dominant, as well as our own mother tongue, we are often confusing the word and the thing. Actually, we speak around and about things, nestling ever closer to the fire of the thing itself, an ember glowing to light the meaning beyond language.
Knowledge and language are intimately mixed, and free speech is an archival project for specific languages. So I'm going to conclude with reading one small poem. I've written quite a bit about language because I'm interested in these issues. And this poem is called Language. Language without alphabet etches the brain, a felt present, as easily erased as heard, showing sound lives within silence. Discussion is creative, both prelude and aftermath of writing and language. Ideas born in conversation draw on our reading, but grow in sound, not ink, beyond words. How does cognition court affect? It's the chord in the song. The drywall of language is porous. Thank you very much for listening to my thoughts on language extinction. Okay. Thank you very, very much. Your amazing contribution to the to the vision of uh, of of the human room open voice. Thank you.